So without further ado, I would like to ask um, uh, his uh, Excellency Stephen Lilly, CMG, who, was, who has been the British High Commissioner to Cyprus since April 2018, to give a few introductory remarks. Well, Dr. Haji Yorghiu, uh, fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Let me add my own thanks to everybody who's been uh, involved in the uh, organisation of tonight's webinar, including uh, the British High Commission, uh, Andreas Demetriou, who's uh, also uh, online. And if you do, ha I apologise in advance that I have to leave when I've finished. But if you have specific questions for the uh, for the British government, then feel free to put them in the chat, and we will pick them up. Um, but let me say what a pleasure it is to collaborate again with UCLan on this latest um, transparency seminar. Um, UCLan is a pioneer of British university education in Cyprus. Uh, it's a long established friend and partner of the High Commission. And it's always a pleasure for us to work with you in support of issues that will further uh, increase understanding between the UK and Cyprus and actually will contribute to the development of both countries. And I'm really pleased that this latest collaboration is to promote greater awareness of what is meant by transparency and its importance in making states more open and accountable. A strong commitment to open government and open societies is a central feature of the UK government's Global Britain strategy and our mission to be a force for good in the world. Uh, some of you will be aware of the integrated review of security, defence, development and foreign policy, which we published in March this year. That's the, the British government's foreign policy doctrine, if you like. And as part of that, we committed ourselves to be more active in shaping the open international order of the future, working with others to ensure that it's fit for the 21st century and more resilient to short term shocks and long term challenges. Now, the integrated review recognizes that open societies are crucial building blocks in a sustainable international order, modeling inclusive, accountable and transparent governance. The review commits us to working with our partners and with civil society to promote effective and transparent governance and to support strong, transparent and accountable political processes and institutions internationally. You will see that the word transparent and transparency comes up a lot there. Now, this builds uh, on the very clear commitments that we have already made as a founding member of the Open Government Partnership, which celebrated its 10th anniversary earlier this year. And of course, we're very fortunate to have joining us as our keynote speaker, Mr. Andreas Pavlou, Senior Research Officer at the Open Government Partnerships Europe Division. I don't want to preempt Mr. Pavlou, uh, but I do want to draw attention to the Open Government Declaration, because this has been endorsed by all 78 member countries of the partnership. And it effectively sets out what the partnership is for. It commits us to embrace principles of transparency and open government with a view towards achieving greater prosperity, well-being and human dignity in our own countries and in an increasingly interconnected world. There are detailed commitments in a number of areas, but specific, I think, for today to increase the availability of information about governmental activities, to support civic participation, to implement the highest standards of professional integrity throughout our administrations, to increase access to new technologies for openness and accountability. Now, of course, Cyprus isn't part of the Open Government Partnership, but these are principles that I think are relevant to any govern government and which all governments should aspire to. Transparency has also been an important element of the UK's presidency of the Group of Seven this year. Participants of the G7 summit in July agreed the 2021 Open Societies Statement, which among other things, reaffirms and encourages others to commit to accountable 
and transparent governance as part of a democratic system. The statement is consciously issued as it recognizes at a time when internationally freedom and democracy are under challenge from an increasing range of threats. And it's very explicit about this. And it's, of course, not just the kind of really big obvious threats like rising authoritarianism and violent extremism and terrorism, but it's also from threats that are directly relevant to today's subject, electoral interference, corruption, manipulation of information, disinformation, all things that are directly related, as I say, to transparency agenda. And among other things, the signatories to the open society statement have committed ourselves to coordinate effective responses to shared threats to human rights, democracy and the rule of law, to promote economic openness and resilience and to prevent and tackle corruption and illicit financial flows and to promote, to promote integrity, transparency and accountability. And it's just worth re-emphasizing not only that the Open Government Partnership already has 78 member governments or signatory governments, but also the G7 statement is not just the, the statement of seven countries. Um, it was signed by a number of other leaders who were present at the G7 summit. And actually, those leaders between them collectively cover more than half the total population of the global democracies. So I think we can really say that there is global momentum towards greater transparency in government. And I think we can also say, I think this is really important, that, that transparency is not a sort of optional extra uh, for developed countries. Actually, what these statements are saying, what our uh, integrated review is saying is that that transparency is an integral and essential feature of a successful functioning democracy. Now, my final point is to say that the Open Government Partnership members have also pledged themselves to contribute to advancing open government in other countries by sharing best practice and expertise. And that's exactly what we're do, trying to do by supporting events like today's webinar. For me, the nature of the UK-Cyprus relationship means that this is an area where we are well placed to exchange best practice. Dr. Haji Yorhu referred to a, a web of different international agreements and groupings and, of course, to the Commonwealth and the Council of Europe. We also, of course, have at a kind of e even deeper level our shared common law systems, the institutional links, shared heritage, a huge web of professional and educational training and qualifications shared across both countries. There's a lot of common ground between us, a common outlook on many issues. So if British experience is relevant anywhere, then it should be relevant here in Cyprus, but also in the other direction, we can learn from each other. So on that note, let me just say once again that I'm very pleased that UCLan have brought us together again in this forum to discuss and share expertise and experiences from both countries. And I hope that today's discussion creates and generates new ideas about how our two countries can work together to promote transparency at home and in the world. And I wish you a very fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I should have made an announcement at the, at the beginning that the event carries by the, the event carries um, two verified CPD points for lawyers and um, everyone has returned everyone who is admitted in the meeting has returned their consent form just to let you know that you have to stay for the duration of the seminar in order to receive the two cpd points not that you wouldn't want to stay here anyway um so with that announcement also out of the way i would like to invite 
our keynote speaker, Andreas Pavlo, to deliver his um, presentation. Before I do a few words about Andreas, he is um, a senior research officer at Open Government Partnership Europe Div Division. His expertise lies in transparency and access to information related to policy in the EU and across Europe, as well as in citizen engagement and participation. Um, he holds a master's degree in contemporary European studies from the University of Bath and a bachelor's degree in European studies and modern languages from the University of Birmingham. Andrea, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. I have a presentation. Um, so please let me know if you can see the presentation in full screen. Yes. Yeah, OK, perfect. Um, thank you very much. And uh, just to reiterate, I guess, some of the things which um, were talked about by the High Commissioner. Uh, my name is Andreas Pavlou. I'm the Senior uh, Research Officer for Europe at the Open Government Partnership uh, Independent Reporting Mechanism. Now, the Open Government Partnership is a um, international initiative that is now 10 years old. It's our 10th anniversary. And um, we uh, promote accountable, responsive and inclusive governance. Um, it was an initiative launched by government leaders and civil society advocates back in 2011, including uh, people like Barack Obama. And um, there are currently now uh, 78 countries that are members of the uh, initiative. Uh, there's 76 local governments from cities like Madrid and Paris to uh, regions in uh, the Philippines and um, in South America. And as part of the wider community, there are thousands of civil society organizations, academics, private businesses, etc., who um, collaborate as part of the OGP. Our scope is uh, global, as you can see. Um, we have many uh, different countries uh, that take part from all the different continents of the world. And um, the way that we work is that um, uh, the upon, uh, upon joining the initiative, uh, governments collaborate with civil society to co-create uh, two-year action plans. And these action plans include uh, concrete reforms and uh, commitments towards uh, enhancing transparency, enhancing civic participation and public accountability. Now, this particular model that we have ensures that civil society organizations and citizens are directly able to influence and um, uh, draft uh, commitments that governments then uh, take forward and implement. And since we began in 2011, we've seen over 4,000 commitments made globally by our members, by member uh, countries. Now, my role in the independent reporting mechanism as a senior research officer is to provide that accountability side of it. So there's on the one hand, it's great that these countries make all these commitments. Uh, on the other hand, there is now um, my role and a role within my team as well uh, that I work with to provide accountability. So in the re independent reporting mechanism, we monitor and assess the commitments and the ambition of those commitments, but we also assess the um, uh, implementation and the final results of those commitments as well. So there is a learning phase uh, where countries can then uh, use those findings to also improve upon uh, their commitments in future action plans as well. And all of this takes, uh, these are we, we do in, our, in reports that we produce, and these are also published alongside the kind of self-assessments that governments themselves also um, uh, publish. That's how the OGP works. That kind of gives you a sense of uh, where I'm coming from and uh, hopefully explains a little bit further what the High Commissioner was also referring to in practice. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking to you mainly about the context here in Cyprus and the right of access to information uh, and transparency uh, in the Republic of Cyprus. I'm also going to be talking a little bit about the history of how the law came about and uh, what the law actually looks like, how you can use it, 
and how it's actually worked in practice uh, in some cases. I'll also cover some of the challenges and provide my own recommendations about how I think the future of the law will need to be uh, seen in practice. So what is government transparency? I mean, we talk about it, people uh, uh, it, understand it's a very important thing, but government transparency is about knowing who, why, what, how much and how uh, government operates. It's about enabling the public and helping the public to hold power to account. It also helps uh, safeguard and uh, prevent uh, corrupt activities to the best it can. And uh, transparency is also important to enable citizens to participate in decision making. If they have the information, they're able to, uh, at the very basic level, you could say if you have information, you're able to then vote on who you want to be in power. But there's also uh, citizen participation outside of those electoral processes where transparency is also very important when you're talking about uh, legislation, etc. Government transparency is also key in protecting human rights and, you know, uncovering uh, potential violations of those human rights. And essentially, government uh, transparency is crucial in increasing trust in decision makers and public institutions, knowing that the, the, the public are able to see what exactly is going on in government. So when we're talking about that, uh, transparency, what are we talking about in, in practice, I suppose? What does it look like? You know, we have these um, top level theor theoretical ideas, but what does it look like? So access to information is usually one of the ways where transparency manifests itself. So access, there is a right of access to information of the public to access information held by government and public bodies. This is something which uh, is recognised in international standards. Um, which uh, will be talked about later as well. But um, it's something which in Cyprus might seem quite new because the law is relatively new, but actually it's been around for a long time. Many countries have had uh, an access to information law of some kind uh, since the 80s, the 70s, and um, some are even in the 50s. But Sweden uh, was the first country in the world uh, to adopt such a law, which might not be so surprising, but it might surprise you to know that this law was actually adopted in 1766. So the right of access to information as a theory has been around for a rather long time. More recently, um, uh, there have been uh, efforts to um, standardise some of these, uh, the right and, and 2009, the Europe, Council of Europe adopted a convention on access to official documents, which has actually recently uh, been ratified by uh, the minimum number of countries required for the uh, convention to now be adopted throughout the Council of Europe region, which would include Cyprus as well. The right of access to information, also sometimes um, uh, referred to as RTI, is recognised as a fundamental human right as well by the European Court of Human Rights. Now that fundamental human right is recognised uh, within the um, freedom of uh, the right of freedom of expression, uh, with the idea that you can only express yourself uh, fully if you have access to information. The other thing to remember is that uh, access to information. There are two parts of access to information as well. One is proactive. Uh, access to information whereby governments proactively publish information and then there is a reactive part of it which is the right of you as citizens and as individuals to request information from government and receive that information. Now in practice in Cyprus um, that is, uh, well that's what we'll talk about now, um, the right of access to information in Cyprus as I said is relatively new uh, Ten years ago, however, there was a piece of research uh, conducted by some civil society groups, uh, one called Access Info Europe, which is a Europe-wide organisation based in Madrid. And they did this, uh, they produced a report uh, with some local civil society organisations in Cyprus on the right of access to information. Now, this um, research included over 400, oh, nearly 400 requests to public bodies, uh, 20 public bodies of which 7% provided information uh, to the requests. 72% of those uh, public bodies 
or 72 percent of the requests sorry were not answered at all there was complete administrative silence they received no response that is quite bad really <laughs> as you can imagine and something which uh, was a huge finding at the time in terms of proactive transparency the research found that uh, core information like budgets or expenditure information is only available proactively by uh, in 13 percent of the public bodies that were uh, researched now since then uh, legislative proposals were produced uh, in 2014 and there was civil society campaigning of which I was also a part of and um, in fact uh, at one point the minister at the time I think for uh, public order and justice uh, had committed uh, to producing a law which was the best in Europe or with the highest European standards which is something which still probably is to be seen and to be uh, researched but um, that's what they committed to the law was finally adopted in december 2017 um, law 1184 i uh, 20 slash 2017 and it came into force three years later uh, in 2020 december 2020 so it's not even a year old yet but with three years for uh, preparing for the law to come into force you would imagine that that would mean that um, institutions would be fully prepared for uh, implementing uh, the law once it came into force. That's something which uh, is questionable, I think, and I'll come to later as well. Now, the law itself, I'm just going to explain a little bit about it to give you a sense of what exactly it means, how exactly it works and what it kind of looks like. So the law uh, was is, a, is in many ways a, a, a a copy of the British law, which is quite a strong law um, and which um, uh, makes sense given the similar juris the, the similar um, legal framework and uh, infrastructure uh, and Cy between Cyprus and the UK. Now, the law gives anyone the right to request information from government institutions. That means anyone. That doesn't necessarily mean only citizens. It could be anyone. And it allows uh, you to request information from the executive, parliament and judiciary, although obviously we're focusing on the executive here. And in terms of how you make that request, it may seem like doing uh, interacting with public services and with institutions in Cyprus is quite difficult. But essentially, this makes it really, really simple. All you need to do is provide is send a, a message, whether that be an email address, an email or a letter or whatever. But all you need to provide is your name, a contact address and a description of the information that you're wanting. Uh, you don't need to provide a reason as to why you want that information. And institutions are required to answer within 30 days of you sending that request. Now, there are fees that technically they could apply if, for example, you wanted paper versions of a document that is hundreds and hundreds of pages long. Um, but in reality, those kinds of fees don't really exist in practice because uh, the majority were of your work of the information is probably going to be requested via um, electronic copies and online. So the costs are, are negligible, if anything. The law also includes uh, sanctions for officials who think who decide to destroy documents uh, illegally, essentially. So, for example, if you were to make a request for a document, and the public official were to destroy that document or delete that document um, after you've requested it, that would be considered uh, sanctionable and um, is something which they would get a, a financial sanction for. If you're not happy with the uh, answer to your request, you don't get a reply or uh, the information is somehow uh, not full uh, in terms of what's provided or you've been charged fees that you don't agree with or you just don't get any response you also have a right to an appeal as well which can go straight to the information commissioner which is a body that was set up uh, specifically to oversee the implementation of this right it's actually the same person who is also the privacy commissioner and that is quite common in other countries such as the uk where that role is held by one body um, because of the kind of interactions between the two uh, rights now, the um, Information Commission is a free uh, appeal system as well, uh, which is good, and its decisions are binding. So if it decides that the information should be made public, then the um, 
institutions should uh, do so. The Information Commissioner can review documents uh, that are requested. Um, it can it has powers of inspection, so it could go to a ministry or, or a public body and uh, inspect the documents and inspect the buildings and files. And if for whatever reason an Information Commissioner's decision uh, is appealed, those appeals go to the Supreme Court, who then have the final appeal. And that could be taken by the government if they don't agree with the decision, or you could always take it if you don't decide if you don't agree with the decision of the information commissioner yourself. Now that all sounds great and um, it might sound like uh, the uh, that you can just get all kinds of information but it is worth remembering that the law also gives uh, provides for legitimate exceptions. So there are some exceptions to transparency which are legitimate and which are allowed by international standards. Um, and, that, and there are reasons why you why government might not want or wouldn't be required to give uh, public information uh, information to the public at certain points. So here is a full list of those exceptions in the uh, Cypriot law. As you'll see, there are one list which is the exceptions. There's three uh, exceptions there which uh, are outside those international standards, um, and you know are things which uh, could be questioned. Um, but uh, you will also, and all these exceptions are, um, well, you'll see that there are exceptions here which have asterisks and ones which don't have asterisks. Those which don't have asterisks next to them are uh, absolute exceptions. So if you request information about any of those uh, topics, essentially um, the request could be, uh, or the, the government could decide to apply the exception and uh, not provide you that information. You'll see that some uh, exceptions here have one asterisk and that means that they require a harm test. Now that means that when uh, someone makes a request for that particular piece of information, whether it be national security here or development of government policy, for example, the public official needs to consider whether disclosure of the information will lead to an actual harm to that interest. So if it does, then they might decide to reject the uh, publication of that information. You'll also see that some exceptions have two asterisks next to them, and that means that they require a public interest test. Now that means that even if there is a harm to the public interest, uh, if, if, sorry, even if there is a harm to the protected interest, uh, if there is a a public interest in disclosure, then that overrides any potential harm uh, which uh, might have been identified. So, for example, you'll see there commercial interests has two asterisks next to it at the bottom. And, uh, you know, in a procurement process, maybe the contract uh, will have the uh, amount of money uh, being paid to a private company that's won a particular tender. Now, that is a commercial interest that maybe they want to keep secret and could provide a harm to the company. However, there is a overriding public interest in knowing the public money that is being spent on a particular procurement uh, process. And so therefore that would re probably require the information to be required, uh, be published because of that overriding public interest. In any case, with all of these exceptions, officials must provide reasons for the refusal. So you must always receive a, a reason as to why you, the information maybe has been refused uh, disclosure. And also they should provide information on the next steps in terms of how you can appeal that decision. Now, on paper, this is how it may all look, but in practice, you might be wondering, what's the reality? Well, before um, actually uh, coming here uh, and giving this presentation, I uh, decided to make some requests myself to see whether to see to what extent the law actually is working. And I looked both at the proactive and reactive side of access to information. So the law does require that um, uh, ministries, for example, uh, public bodies uh, publish their publication plans, which are um, a list of kind of the information that they hold and the procedures for how to uh, publish um, or how to uh, request information. And what I found was that of the, I think, 12 ministry websites that I looked at, only five actually had uh, publication plans available on their websites. 
I also looked to see whether the websites had any kind of uh, contact details. Um, and I found that 11 had at least an email address that I could contact to make a request for information. Now that um, is fine, but at the same time, it does make me wonder whether those are being monitored, those email inboxes, or whether the people at the other end of those email inboxes understand that maybe people might be making requests uh, there. So having seen that only five publication plans were requested, uh, were available, I also looked at um, making my own requests. So I decided to make some requests. Um, I requested uh, from 11 ministries um, information uh, via those uh, email addresses. I asked for two things. I said, I asked uh, whether they could give me the number of requests that they have received uh, in relation to the law. Uh, the access to information law. And then I also asked them if they had any resources or documentation that they have used to help train public officials on the implementation of the law. Now, I'm sure you'll all be interested in finding out who answered and who didn't. And here are the results. So I got responses from the Ministry of Agriculture and Ministry of Finance, who just have actually up until now have responded with an acknowledgement of receipt and that they'll get back to me. I have yet to hear from them. And I also received a response from the Ministry of Defence who asked me to provide my name, to provide uh, a contact address, to clarify my question and to provide a reason as to why I was asking this information. To which I responded, this is my name, this is my contact address, my email, and I clarified the question for them. And I also said, uh, and I also clarified to them that the law doesn't require me to uh, provide a reason and therefore um, I shan't be providing a reason. And then a few, I think a week later or, or soon after, um, I received a response from the Ministry of Defence and they uh, answered my question. They said that they have received no re uh, requests under the um, uh, umbrella of the access to information law uh, since it was adopted and uh, that they, the uh, provision of documentation, um, so the, one sec, I have the, here, the translation here, the uh, competent authority for the issuance of instructions on the execution of the law is the information commissioner, and therefore I should ask the information commissioner for that information. Now, for some people, they might think that isn't an answer or that that isn't really the answer that you want, but actually it's really uh, important good to see a that they have uh, implemented the law uh, to uh, a, a decent degree and um, that they have provided some information knowing that they haven't received any requests since the law was put into effect is really really interesting and also knowing that they see the role of training to be that of the information commissioner is also really really interesting now this brings me to think about what are the challenges and my recommendations that I would give to the institutions and to uh, citizens around this law. So the first thing I would like to say is that I really, really think it's important and it's evident that officials need training. Public officials need training on how to implement this law. They need to uh, understand what their role is, how, how they're supposed to answer requests and um, that they have these uh, uh, publication plans published on their websites. That's really, really, really important. Uh, that's something which is a requirement by the law. And so if they're not doing that, they're already breaking the law in that respect. The other thing to remember is that the information commissioner needs to be far more proactive than it currently is. It's evident that officials maybe aren't trained effectively if they're not answering requests or, it, or these publication plans are not available online the information commissioner needs to be in contact with them and needs to be ensuring that the law is being in properly enforced. So that also requires that the information commissioner do some public awareness raising for the public to understand what their rights are and what uh, how they can request information and uh, enable them to do so uh, effectively. Now, the information commissioner is also due to be uh, producing an annual report on uh, the implementation of the law. So I'll be interested to see what that looks like when they produce it. And I assume they will send it to Parliament for approval and for uh, discussion. But in any case, I think it's evident that the information commissioner needs to be doing far more than it already is. I, last time I looked on their website, there was um, 
maybe one communication from January earlier this year, and there's been nothing since then. And I think that's really, really, uh, it, a lot more needs to be done basically from their side to make sure that this law is uh, effective and works properly. So those are the institutional kind of uh, recommendations I have at this point. Um, I don't think that we need to be looking at reforming the legislation. It's really more about um, making sure that what we have on paper at the moment is put into force and into practice. And that also means that there is a responsibility for us as citizens and, and um, individuals to use the law. That means uh, we are citizens, lawyers, uh, students, uh, journalists and civil society organisations and everybody need to be using this law and need to be making requests uh, to uh, make sure that institutions are accountable for their actions. It also requires that we as uh, individuals are challenging these poor procedures. So where they don't respond, we need to challenge that. We need to take it to the Information Commissioner who is a free appeal system. We need to make, uh, if they overuse uh, exemptions or if they use poorly uh, the exemptions that are in the law we need to challenge it and we need to be building a case law uh, uh, around this so that the law is more effective so that it's clearer what information can and should be made public and to essentially hold institutions accountable for the information that they hold and the role that they have in making sure that we as individuals and as citizens are uh, informed and are um, able to participate effectively in public policy making, um, hold uh, governments to account, protect our human rights, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So my call, I guess, at this point is for you as individuals to, to make your own requests, to think about what information do you need uh, for research that you're doing, uh, maybe some kind of journalistic investigation you are conducting. What information do you need from these institutions? And, and, and I would challenge you to uh, make requests and make sure that the law works. I'd like to say at this point, uh, thank you for listening to me. If you want any more information, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, my email address is there. I have uh, a Twitter handle. You can also contact me. There's more information about the Open Government Partnership as well on the Open Government Partnership website. And if you'd like access to the report as well from the research from 10 years ago, then um, that's also available on the accessinfo.org website and I can share those um, as well. But at this point, I'd like to say thank you very much and uh, hand it back to Nasia. Thank you so much, Andrea. I have about a million questions for you. Uh, so I really look forward to the Q&A. Before I, before I give the floor to Claire, because I, because I just can't help myself, I will share an anecdote. Um, something that happened to me, I have on numerous occasions tried to get information from the government uh, for research purposes. Um, I almost always fail. Um, the, the, the one before the last time that I tried to get information, I was working on a project and I was actually an external consultant for a government body. So I was, I was a private researcher doing work for the government. But I thought it would be an interesting exercise to try and get the information in my capacity as a private researcher. So rather than as a government contractor. So I contacted the police and I asked for information on a, a breakdown of the nationality of the people who are convicted of different crimes. And I was told very explicitly, no hiding, that they are not providing this information because they are worried that they would be accused of racism. And um, I then had to do my job, the one that I was getting paid for. So I contacted the government, the, the government, the part of the government that was paying me, and I told them I can't get the information as a private citizen. I need you to get the information and um, for me. And they did. And the and, and and the interesting part of this story is that when I got the information. I don't think there was actually any evidence of racism here. I mean, they were, and I think that the job that the police was doing was good job. But they are so worried that what they, the information they provide is going to be harmful to themselves or potentially will be harmful to themselves that they are, I think, creating even more mistrust. And so, yes, that was my story. I. 
uh, I will now yield the floor to my uh, colleague, Dr. Claire Hoskiriagiris. Um, Claire is a senior visiting fellow at UCLan Cyprus. Uh, he's a senior visiting fellow of English law and legal practice. He is also a non-practicing solicitor in England and Wales, and he's hugely passionate about transparency. So I, I, I think there is, um, um, you know, there are very few people who are better suited uh, than Claire has to give a talk on this. So Claire. Claire here. Can you hear me? Yes, Nasia. I think Claire uh, is having a, a technical issue. So if we can uh, get some questions until we resolve this. Yes, yes. Whenever you're ready, because I, as I said, I'm, I'm bursting to ask my questions. But because I have already asked a few questions, can I ask, is anyone in the audience um, happy to ask any questions or, or should I ask mine? Are there any questions uh, from the audience? Andrea. Oh, sorry, it's Andreas. Andrea, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, big thanks to, to Andreas Pavlou for uh, his very excellent and comprehensive presentation uh, on the law. Uh, my question has to do with, um, with privacy issues. I understand that, you know, uh, it's been, what, five years now since the GDPR has been put into force. I think slowly but surely the Cypriot society has somewhat gotten used uh, to using the law. And, uh, you know, sh sharing ex an experience with Anasia for when I was working in the private sector, I have to say that uh, there were fears, but I, now I think that even the people who have the companies that have to implement it are less fearful of the of uh, privacy laws, and I'm wondering to what extent uh, this may counterbalance um, the introduction of the transparency law. Like, what what are the dynamics between the two? Yep. Shall I answer that, or is there any other questions? I can go straight into. No, that. no, please, yeah. please answer the question, and then we'll take more. So. So uh, often people think that transparency or access to information and privacy are going to be sort of two ends of the spectrum and that they're, they're not compatible or there's some kind of um, problem there. But it, it they, they serve two different purposes, right? Like the GDPR serves as to protect um, uh, people's uh, personal data and their privacy versus uh, the access to information law, which is about government held information being available to the public. Now, these aren't, uh, they have those two different aims, which aren't necessarily incompatible, but there is a tension between them and that does require uh, judgments to be made, right? And um, it's a great area. So it's not clear cut necessarily uh, all the time. Often, so on the one hand, the privacy and in terms of the, um, private institutions, that's one, uh, like businesses, that's one thing. Uh, when it comes to how the privacy laws are um, implemented by public institutions alongside the transparency law, that's where it starts to get a little bit more complicated maybe. And questions like, to what extent do you publish the names of public officials? To what extent uh, uh, do you publish the names of people who make decisions or not? I think it's uh, often in, uh, it's clearer that those who are in public office uh, should have their names made public uh, for in decisions or in you know meetings, uh, notes of meetings and things like that if they're available. Um, potentially senior public officials as well. But should the note taker at the meeting, if they're a you know a, a low uh, administrative um, official, should their name be made public? Is that fair? Is that not? Is that, you know, reasonable? Um, and it's something which essentially until cases come to come in front of the courts uh, or in front of the information commissioner, it's really not easy to tell yet uh, where the line is 
really. Um, I would err uh, on being more transparent than less transparent when it comes to things around uh, the uh, around um, public accountability of public officials. I think it's very clear that those who are elected officials and who are decision makers should be uh, should have uh, there is an overriding public interest in having those names uh, available where you know uh, maybe a meeting has happened and there's notes of a meeting which someone has requested um, I think on the other hand you know when it comes to data for example uh, like the police police data there are uh, cases where you know you don't want to release certain information about individuals for example um, or where publishing people's names might put them in danger if they're individual police officers uh, on a particular case or even if it's you know uh, specific uh, data where you have identified one person from a specific country that potentially is a breach of their of that kind of personal data uh, which means they could be identified so there's I mean I'm not an expert on it but there's it's a gray area essentially and it's something which will be clarified over time but many other countries in Europe are dealing with it um, I would point to also the UK information commissioner who has loads of great guidance on it and which probably will be more relevant to the Cypriot context because of the similar jurisdictions as well so I would say um, have a look at what the information commissioner in the UK says about that Thank you so much, Andrea. Just to be clear about the example I gave before, the information I was work, I was looking for was aggregated data, so statistics, nothing to do with privacy, and still I had a problem getting it. Um, Andrea, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask something, Andreas Pavlou. Um, you mentioned that you submitted a series of requests um, so I wanted to ask you whether there is a specific way or a template which we'll use when um, when uh, uh, invoking our right to information because when I did it um, with the Minister of, of Defence in the UK it was a simple letter, no templates. Is this the same way in Cyprus as well? Uh, I believe so. I mean, I so the way I did it was I uh, wrote an email uh, which said under the law uh, 187, 184, 2017, I'd like to request the following information, bullet point, bullet point with my questions and then uh, signed it off with my name. Um, it wasn't a it, there wasn't a template there wasn't any it wasn't evident to me that there was a template uh there was no information really from the institutions about how to do it so that was the way that i did it in a in the most simple way i think it was important at that st at this stage probably to quote the name of the law so that they understand what their obligations are and that it and that they, it makes it more difficult for them to say as institutions that they didn't understand uh, under what law you're um, applying, you're making a request for information. In somewhere like the UK, that's not required. And you can just make a request and the institutions automatically are supposed to treat it like an access to information or access to environmental information uh, request. But I would probably be cautious. I mean, there's arguments for and against it inside. Uh, uh, but I would probably say it's better to just quote the the, the the, the law in that respect to not say that you're making a request under the law so that the institutions are aware that you know uh, under what expectations you're getting a request but that isn't necessarily how it should be um, they should be applying the law regardless of whether you know which law you're making a request under thank you so much uh, we have another question from the audience Julie Papa Nicolau right uh, yeah thank you uh, thanks Andreas for your uh, Excellent. Uh, for your presentation, the info was uh, very, very useful. What I wanted to know is, um, you said that the Information Commissioner is the competent body who will oversee uh, that the law is implemented properly. And uh, clearly, according to your research, um, there are a few gaps. So who would oversee that the Commissioner is actively um, ensuring that the law is being implemented. Is that up to the public uh, or, or how, I mean, because if somebody is not going to be pushing uh, the commission and the commission is not doing it himself or herself, um, who, who, who is going to be, uh, who's got that responsibility? So I would need to check the law itself because I think there are mechanisms in there about how the um, 
So the, the commissioner is appointed. Um, it is, I believe, response like the annual report has to go to Parliament. So I would imagine that Parliament, therefore, is kind of overseeing the information commissioner, um, which again is quite normal in many countries as well. Um, but at the same time, there is um, the public pressure, like public pressure, uh, pressure from the media, et cetera, for someone like the information commissioner to be doing their job properly also has its role to play. And I know in some countries, uh, in particular in the Balkans and uh, also in the UK, that uh, media uh, journalistic pressure and public pressure more broadly um, has, uh, I guess, kept the information commissioner um, active. But it, yeah, I'd need to double check legally what kind of the uh, requirements are or, or how it works. But um, there is a lot to say about the importance of uh, the media and uh, the public in, 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 in keeping the pressure up. And in many ways, that comes down to people making appeals to the commissioner. If the, you know, if the commissioner sees that people are using the law, then they're probably more likely to respond to uh, some of these um, issues as well. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Thank you so much, Claire. Here, good to have you. Um, we very pleased to be uh, to be with you. Can you just uh, make sure that you can hear and see me all right? Is that okay? We can both hear and that, see. That's great. So we started the conversation without you, and I was just about to start with my questions, but I think I will have to wait for, for another half an hour. Um, so the floor is yours. Uh, you have been introduced already and we're waiting for your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. I'll just make sure that I can share this with you. Let me just uh, press the right buttons. OK, can you just confirm that you can see the slides? We can, yes. I'll just uh, blow them up for everyone to see. OK, well. Uh, they blown up? Yes. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much for uh, attending. I'd like to express my uh, gratitude to the chair, everybody who's been involved in organising this event, uh, our, my fellow speaker, who's our keynote speaker, of course, Andreas Bablo, and the, the British High Commission for um, all of their uh, support. What I'd like to do over the next half an hour is build upon the the earlier presentation by uh, focusing on the transparency uh, that we have up to a point in the executive branch of government in the United Kingdom and to tease out some lessons which may be applicable to the uh, Republic of Cyprus. So without further ado, let me begin by looking at some words and the dictionary meaning of some of the words that are going to, to pepper my analysis. I'm going to refer here to the, the online uh, Cambridge Dictionary, which defines the noun transparency as the characteristic of being easy to see through. And this is the essence of, of what transparency is all about, the ability to peer through the walls of government and to look behind those walls of government. It's difficult in practice because there are physical walls, but there are also what I would call spiritual and emotional walls, which uh, in certain parts of the world prevent a citizen from penetrating those walls. I'll explain what I mean by that uh, as, as we go, go along. The noun openness, interestingly enough, is def defined as quite simply honesty. So the idea of being open is not only a concept that's associated with transparency. The idea of being open is also something that's synonymous with honesty. And honesty, of course, is a noun that is associated with the quality of being honest. And the adjective honest is defined by the Cambridge Dictionary as telling the truth or being able to be trusted and not likely to steal, cheat or lie. And when we, we look at the concept of corruption in government, corruption in government is often, though not wholly, associated with uh, stealing, cheating or lying. Of course, corruption is also associated with the misuse or the abuse of power. 
As for accountability, uh, this is defined as the uh, fact of being responsible for what one does and being able to give a satisfactory reason for it or the degree to which this has happened. Now, I've deliberately begun by zooming in on these words, transparency, openness and accountability, because they are three of the, uh, together with, uh, we rephrase that, accountability, openness and honesty are among the seven um, uh, principles of public life that were defined by Lord Nolan, uh, then a, a law lord during the mid 1990s, uh, as a result of the then uh, cash for question scandal, which uh, blighted the uh, the government headed by Prime Minister John Major uh, from 1992 until 1997. These are the principles which must guide the conduct of everybody who holds public office in the United Kingdom. They're, I've listed the seven for you on the slide. You can read the details on the hyperlink that I've given you. But the three that are relevant uh, to this presentation are the ones that I've highlighted there, accountability, openness, and uh, honesty. Now, what am I going to do in the next 25 or so minutes, 30 maximum, is advance four propositions and my overall aim in advancing these four propositions is to suggest to the members of the audience, especially the members of the legal profession, that in any specific case where the uh, client or the citizen is seeking either truth or justice, the new freedom of information law in the Republic of Cyprus is a very handy tool to have in the lawyer's toolkit. But, and this is the key point, that law, that new freedom of information law that was enacted in 2017 and brought into force in 2020, that new law should be seen as part and parcel of a much wider and deeper toolkit of um, mechanisms and tools that a lawyer or a citizen might want to deploy in search of either truth or justice. Now, I make this point because traditionally the lawyer client relationship is associated with the court of law and the court of law as the, uh, the traditional venue through which justice and the truth can be uh, secured. But my, my message to you today is that yes, the new freedom of information law is very important and as a backup mechanism, the court is there to help ensure that that new law uh, is uh, fulfilled. But that law should be uh, seen as part of, of a much bigger picture or a much deeper and wider toolkit. And that um, a lawyer advising a client should um, adopt a holistic approach to trying to secure justice and to trying to secure access to the truth through uh, information, accurate information. So here, here are my four uh, principles, or my four propositions rather, which are going to guide my um, uh, analysis today. The first proposition is that transparency goes hand in hand with accountability and other fundamental pro principles associated with a modern democratic society under the rule of law such as open justice, open government, freedom of information and public consultation. So transparency is interlinked with those other concepts that I've, I've mentioned. The second principle, the second proposition rather that I'm going to put forward is that freedom of information, which is the concept that is at the heart of the new law in the Republic of Cyprus, and it's also the heart of the Freedom of Information Act 2000 in the United Kingdom. Freedom of information is bound up with freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, and other manifestations of, of the common law notion of freedom under the law. Third proposition, uh, the third proposition is that freedom of information laws are key enablers of transparency and accountability. However, such laws are not enough, especially in a sovereign state such as the Republic of Cyprus, 
or indeed the United Kingdom. Those freedom of information laws must, if they are to be effective, be supplemented by other enablers, such as a democratic anti-corruption culture, which is steeped in ethics and embedded with what I call the facilitators of transparency and accountability, uh, some of which I'll d discuss in this presentation. The fourth proposition is that there is much to learn from what has gone wrong, from what has been put right, and from what has been done well in the United Kingdom. So those are the four propositions that I'm going to be advancing uh, throughout uh, this presentation. Let me begin with the final one. Oh, my screen has frozen. Let's begin with the final one by learning from what has gone wrong in uh, the United Kingdom in the dim and distant past. And I'm going to use here as my case study uh, David Lloyd George. He uh, has gone down in history as a remarkable prime minister and indeed a, a remarkable pro chancellor of the Exchequer. But what I want to focus on today is uh, David Lloyd George as a case study in alleged impropriety in the years before the modern mechanisms of transparency and accountability came into existence. Now, he held the, the post of Chancellor of the Exchequer, the, the Ministry of uh, the Treasury, to all intents and purposes, from uh, 1908 until 1915, and he was Prime Minister from 1916 until 1922. He was the first and hitherto the only solicitor to serve as the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Several barristers, uh, by contrast, have served as Prime Minister, including Asquith, Attlee, Thatcher and Blair. But here is the key point. As a Minister of the Crown and as Prime Minister, David Lloyd George engaged in a number of legally or morally questionable activities, which were carried out behind closed doors and in the absence of the modern mechanisms of transparency and accountability available today. So let's have a look at briefly what he did or allegedly did wrong. <coughs> Firstly, and this is, um, I would suggest, relevant uh, to some of the things that have gone on in the Republic of Cyprus and some of the allegations that have been flung around, and indeed some of the court cases that have um, established wrongdoing in the uh, executive branch of government and indeed in the the local government. Uh, David Lloyd George was involved in the, the so-called Marconi insider training scam. You can look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica or, or other appropriate sources for the details. The point is that um, David Lloyd George, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, together with Rufus Isaacs, the Attorney General, and one or two other ministers, it conducted their business affairs in private in a way that brought their private business interests into conflict or appeared to bring their private interests into conflict with their, their public duties. And even though these ministers got away with it, the, um, the, 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 the nub of the allegation against David Lloyd George was as follows. And I'm reading here from the, uh, the, 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 the motion that was moved from uh, George Cave, the King's Counsel, who later served as Solicitor General and Lord Chancellor, he was a, as a very senior lawyer, but also a politician. Uh, he uh, alleged that the, the ministers involved in this scandal breached a very basic general principle. No minister ought to engage in transactions which may bring his private interest or his private sense of obligation into conflict with his public duties. And one of the uh, things that we'll see a little bit later on that's gone well in the United Kingdom, up to a point, is the attempt to, re to address this particular problem. It's addressed through um, reasonably full uh, registers and lists that ministers have to submit details to. But the point is, this is really where so many scandals tend to arise from. It's where a holder of public office, be it a minister or a, or a public servant or the chair of a public body, allows the perception to arise that there is a conflict between their uh, public role and their private or their business interests. 
The second scandal that David Lloyd George was involved in was the so-called cash for honours scandal. He, he was alleged to have been uh, banding out uh, honours, peerages and knighthoods in return for donations to his political party, the Liberal Party. And the gist of the allegation is, is on, on the slide there. It was presented in the House of Lords on the 29th of June 1925 by Lord Salisbury, the then Lord Privy Seal. The point that I'm making here is that David Lloyd George, in this scandal, didn't muddle up his private affairs and his business affairs on the one hand with his public duties on the other. Here, there was a conflict or the appearance of a conflict between David Lloyd George's responsibilities as prime minister in his public role and his party political role in the in the Liberal Party. And again, if we want, if one goes through history, one sees this uh, pattern played out whereby a scandal arises because the holder of public office has muddled up or allegedly muddled up or appears to have muddled up their public duties on the one hand with their party political duties or responsibilities on the other. And without naming anybody or um, uh, citing any cases, all I would say is that here in the Republic, uh, in the case of the Republic of Cyprus, uh, one sees this uh, phenomenon uh, played out on an almost daily basis, whereby on the one hand, the public duty of a public servant appears to uh, collide with uh, an underlying party political motive or uh, party political connection. Now, in the United Kingdom, the, the Lloyd George uh, Cash for Honour scandal led to the Honours Prevention of Abuses Act in 1925. Now, there was a third, uh, well, it was covered up at the time, but it was, I'll use the word scandal anyway. There was a third scandal involving David Lloyd George in that for much of his political career, he conducted a clandestine and indeed covered up extramarital affair with Francis Stevenson, his private secretary. Uh, they eventually married in 1943 towards the end of David Lloyd George's life after uh, his first wife had died in, in 1941. Now, every minister of the crown is entitled to a private life. The problem arises uh, when a, an extramarital affair or indeed any other uh, relationship in the private life of a minister comes into conflict with or appears to come into conflict with the minister's um, um, public duties. And again, without naming any names or citing any cases, one can think of uh, examples from the Republic of Cyprus where a uh, a prominent public figure has a public role and an appearance worse has arisen whereby the, the family relationship appears to have come into conflict with the public duty. And this is uh, something that emerges from British history as well. Perhaps the most graphic and, and, and um, horrendous example of this arose from the from Profumo scandal in, in 1963, where the problem wasn't so much the extramarital affair conducted by uh, John Profumo with a lady who was uh, sharing herself with uh, the, the Soviet attache in the, the, Soviet em the then Soviet embassy in London. The, the minister, John Profumo, made things worse by misleading or appearing to mislead Parliament about the affair. He claimed that there was no impropriety in his relationship with uh, Christine Keeler, whereas clearly there was. And he actually resigned uh, as a result of, of the scandal. So these are some lessons from, from, from British political history that are worth bearing in mind. So to sum up on, on David Lloyd George, what we learned from David Lloyd George and his various scandals is number one, if you're in the public sector, do not allow your background, business interests to be muddled up with or appear to be muddled up with your uh, public duties. Number two, don't allow your party political affiliations, if you're a minister, to interfere with your public duties. And number three, well, if you're going to conduct an extramarital affair, make sure you do it outside the office, away from your secretary, in 
in the complete and isolated sphere of your private life and that you don't mislead Parliament or anybody else about the matter. So those are just three case studies. Um, what I just said to you about um, accountability uh, going hand in hand with transparency is something that's reflected in the uh, UN Convention uh, Against Corruption. I've given you there a quotation from the foreword of Kofi Annan. You can read the full convention in the hyperlink that I've given you. The point that Kofi Annan has made here uh, is that the convention uh, sends a clear message he claims that the international community is determined to prevent and control corruption. It reaffirms the importance of core values such as honesty, respect for the rule of law, accountability and transparency. And those principles are embedded in Article 5 of the UN uh, Convention Against Corruption, which refers to the rule of law, the proper management of public affairs, of public property integrity, transparency and accountability. So that goes back to my proposition that transparency goes hand in hand with, with accountability. And the United Kingdom uh, has tried to uh, fulfil uh, the spirit and the wording of the UN uh, Convention Against Corruption with a number of initiatives such as the three that I've placed on the screen. Let me just move on now to the uh, legislative framework the legislative framework in England that promotes transparency, accountability uh, and other features of de democratic anti-corruption culture. Now, the question here is whether the, the Republic of Cyprus has all of these uh, elements of law in its uh, domestic uh, legislative framework. That's something that, that the lawyers in the audience might want to just look up and, 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 and consider. But in England, at least, in the United in England, I'm speaking about England because the position may be slightly different in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, where there are devolved uh, governments. But in England, the, um, the anti-corruption culture is built around acts of parliament, such as the Honours Prevention of Abuses Act 1925 that I mentioned earlier, the Public Record Act, which was uh, the forerunner in a sense to the Freedom of Information Act that was limited to the release of public records into the National Archives, or the Public Record Office as it used to be called. The Parliamentary Commissioner Act facilit 1967 facilitates transparency in a sense through the Ombudsman. Uh, the Theft Act of course enables uh, crimes such as false accounting to be prosecuted. Uh, some of the members of parliament who were caught up in the uh, uh, expenses and allowances scandal were prosecuted under the Theft Act for uh, false accounting. The, the leading case on that is the Crown and David Chater and others which reached the Supreme Court. The Public Interest Disclosure Act facilitates transparency through uh, the whistleblowing mechanisms that apply to the private uh, and, and uh, in this context, the public sector. The Government Resources and Accounts Act 2000 facilitates the publication of annual audited accounts by government ministries. The Freedom of Information Act 2000 uh, has already been mentioned. I'll touch upon that a bit later on. The Environmental Information Regulations 2004 facilitate the free flow or the relatively free flow of information on environmental matters. And uh, there are other acts of parliament that are part of this legislative framework in England, but perhaps the most important for, for our purposes is the transparency of lobbying, non-party campaigning and trade union administration act 2014, which, which sets out the framework of, of legislative regulation of lobbying. That's something that the lawyers uh, in the audience might want to to discuss in the, in the question and answer session, to what extent is lobbying uh, regulated uh, in the Republic of Cyprus? Now, let's look at the, the this picture in a little bit more detail. Um, I want to emphasize here that what we have, have in the United Kingdom uh, government is our mechanisms of uh, or facilitators of account accountability and transparency that have built up over the decades. And by and large, they are effective, although as we saw yesterday in the House of Commons when a resolution was adopted uh, in relation to the House of Commons Committee on Standards, uh, there is a counter argument that some of these mechanisms or that specific mechanism 
it is not fit for purpose. So I'm, I'm gonna, if anyone wants to find out more details about what happened yesterday in the House of Commons, I've given you the link, the hyperlink to the, the proceedings of Parliament, which can be read. That's at the penultimate bullet point on the screen. So what we have in, in the United Kingdom is a culture of, I would suggest, uh, ministerial correspondence and other communications with uh, parliamentarians, and perhaps more importantly for today's purposes, citizens. Um, we heard earlier that there is um, a culture of non-responsiveness in the Republic of Cyprus to uh, requests for information from citizens. I've experienced that over the years. I've sent one letter after another, and I've sent one fax after another in the days of faxes, and I've sent one email after another in the days of email to um, government ministries in the Republic of Cyprus to request information or to request answers to questions. And I've received zero uh, response, absolutely zero response. Sometimes I, I've received a response, but the sometimes are, are exceptionally rare. And the point I'm making here is perhaps the most important ingredient of transparency is the ability of a minister or a ministry to respond to a question, whether the question is put in verbally or in writing. But if a question is put verbally at a meeting, one can understand a minister giving a guarded, wishy-washy response. But if a question is put to a minister or a ministry in writing, the least that the citizen can expect is an answer to that question uh, in writing. And I would suggest for all of the details, for all of the structures of accountability that exist in the United Kingdom, perhaps the most basic one is the, the culture of correspondence, which in my experience by and large works in the United Kingdom. If one sends a letter or an email to a government ministry or a public body, by and large one will receive it. A response. One will initially receive, if it's an email, an auto response. We don't get that in the Republic of Cyprus very often. You get an auto response from the email system acknowledging receipt and a few days later one tends to receive an email providing a more substantive response. Uh, other mechanisms of uh, accountability in the United Kingdom include the doctrine of ministerial accountability to Parliament, internal government procedures under the Cabinet Manual, and the, minister, and the ministerial code. I asked the question here as to whether in the Republic of Cyprus there is an equivalent of the cabinet manual and whether there is an equivalent of the ministerial code and whether either of those documents have been published in the way that the UK equivalent have. Perhaps in the question and answer session, somebody can, can advise me. When I did write to the presidential palace to request copies of uh, various documents um, that are equivalent to the, the, the sort of documents we have uh, in the United Kingdom. This was, I'm writing, I wrote to the Presidential Palace uh, three and a half years ago on this matter. I didn't receive a response. So I didn't receive a response to my reminder email. Um, the, the good thing with the United Kingdom is one can go onto the websites of, of various uh, uh, public bodies or the gov.uk website and, and find uh, these materials that in the United Kingdom we take for granted. So what I put on the screen here and on the next page are a list of the structures of accountability. You can go through them in your own time. Um, let me now, um, judicial review is part of this picture, and failing all of this, one has press freedom, investigative journalism, and academic research to help uh, plug uh, the gaps or open uh, the, uh, the the walls of secrecy in government if uh, something is going on behind closed doors that needs to be brought to the attention of the public. And hopefully if that happens, it happens in an unlawful way without uh, any breaches of things such as the Official Secrets Act or breaches of confidentiality or data protection and so on. But the point I'm making, this is the message that I want to bring across, is that as you can see from these slides, the United Kingdom has a number of different uh, mechanisms of transparency. Another one, another mechanism of transparency is the concept of the independent public inquiry. Now here, this is something I was, I'm very pleased to see we're seeing developed in the Republic of Cyprus. I can think of the, uh, the public inquiry into the Mari disaster chaired by um, Mr. Bolivio, a senior lawyer. 
we had the biggest inquiry into the collapse of, of, of the banking system uh, after 2013. We had the Arestis inquiry into the collapse of the cooperative bank. And more recently, we've had the Nicolados inquiry or the Nicolados investigation. Uh, I think it was called an investigation rather than an inquiry into the, uh, the alleged uh, golden passport scandal. So the Republic of Cyprus has followed the English model of, of hosting, holding public inquiries. In England, it's a little bit more uh, advanced in the sense that, as you can see from the ongoing Grenfell Tower inquiry into the fire in uh, Grenfell Tower, the, 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 the inquiry has itself voluntarily created a number of mechanisms of transparency, such as the website, such as its its hearings, which are op open to the public and live stream uh, as a general rule. Uh, the evidence is published on its website. Uh, other correspondence and documents are published. And there is an, there's even a Grenfell Tower uh, inquiry YouTube channel. Now, in the Republic of Cyprus, if I could make a recommendation here, two recommendations. Firstly, if a lawyer is advising a client and is seeking truth and justice, well, the court is going to be helpful as one potential route to both truth and justice. The problem is that the court has a very limited role in a, in a criminal case. It's there to determine guilt or not non guilt, as the case may be. And in the civil claim, the, the role of the court is there to uphold or, or to dismiss the claim. Uh, a public inquiry can go beyond narrow legal questions to look at deeper uh, issues such as systemic problems or uh, to look at uh, institutional or alleged institutional failings. And this is one of the things that uh, um, I noticed in some of the inquiries in the Republic of Cyprus, that this approach was by and large adopted, that the, the inquiries didn't just look into specific legal issues, they looked at systemic problems and alleged or actual institutional failings. Um, to, let me, I'm looking at the time here, so I'm going to wrap up uh, within the next five minutes, if that's all right. Uh, the, the thing that we ha we've done reasonably well in the in, in the UK government and as regards uh, ministers of the crown who are in parliament and they all are uh, the UK parliament what we've done reasonably well in the United Kingdom is uh, compile lists published lists of ministers interests uh, including uh, the list of relevant interests held by the partner or close family member of each minister and that list of ministers interest is published by the cabinet office you can go and find it on the the hyperlink that i've given you there what's helpful about that list of ministers interest is that ministers each minister must not only disclose uh, certain private uh, interests uh, and perhaps charitable connections that they have they've also got to produce uh, a list of relevant interests that their partner or a spouse or close family member has. Now, what normally happens is once a minister uh, joins the government, they normally divest, they, 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 to all intents and purposes, they get rid of all of their uh, business interests. And if they're, say, a partner in a law firm, they've got to step down from partnership of the law firm. <coughs> but there is a list of ministers' interests that is there to um, uh, ensure uh, a degree of a uh, considerable degree of transparency and uh, ministers also this is very important ministers also are obliged to make quarterly returns on ministerial gifts hospitality travel and meetings that reflects the culture that has built up uh, particularly since the uh, um, enactment of the bribery act uh, 2010 so the quarterly returns must be uh, made. I've given you an example there. You can find the, the quarterly returns of the, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office published on the, uh, the UK government website. But every government minister in every government department must make these quarterly returns. And as I've said earlier, under the, the peculiar uh, overlapping separation of powers that we have in the United Kingdom, every minister of the Crown is also a member of either the House of Commons or the House of Lords and parallel disclosures have to be made to the House of Commons or House of Lords 
authorities. Interestingly enough, in the United Kingdom, we not only have a register for each member of parliament or each member of the House of Lords, we also have a, a register of interests of each secretary or research assistant of each member of the House of Commons or member of the House of Lords. So again, here, what we've seen, what, what the Republic of Cyprus might want to take into account of from the British experience is that the, the, the transparency of each minister is not narrow. It's quite a wide uh, level of transparency. It encompasses the spouse, partner or close family member of each minister, but it also encompasses the uh, secretaries and research assistants of the minister in his or her capacity as a member of the House of Commons or the House, House of Lords. So it's quite a wide approach to transparency uh, and, and declarations uh, of interest. You can read the details in some of the slides that I've given you. Uh, let me just finish with a few words on the philosophy of the Freedom of Information Act uh, 2000. Um, the background to this is censorship and the censorship that was applied most obviously by Hitler's Germany, Stalin's Soviet Union uh, and other totalitarian regimes uh, of the 20th century. And the philosophy of uh, freedom uh, of or the, the, the host the democratic antipathy to censorship was, was most vividly expressed by Lord Bridge of Harwich in his dissenting speech in the, the Spycatcher case, officially known as Attorney General and Guardian Newspapers Limited number one. His dissent uh, formed the basis of a subsequent European Court of Human Rights decision that, uh, that um, was contrary to or held against the United Kingdom. So Lord Bridge's words here, even though they were in a dissenting uh, judgment, uh, carry exceptional weight because of what later happened in the European Court of Human Rights. In any event, this is what Lord Bridge said. Freedom of speech is always the first casualty under a totalitarian regime. Such a regime cannot afford to allow the free circulation of information and ideas among its citizens. Censorship is the indispensable tool to regulate what the public may and what the public may not know. Freedom of speech, therefore, is part and parcel of what uh, the free flow of information is all about. And let me now take you to what Lord Bingham said in the in the, the case of Shaler. This was in the House of Lords in 2002. It was actually on a case to do with a legitimate restriction on freedom of expression, which is to do with um, uh, the intelligence services and the, the prohibition on uh, uh, serving or former intelligence officers disclosing information. But Nonetheless, Lord Bingham took the opportunity in his judgment to lay down certain principles. And this is what he said. The reasons why the right to free expression is regarded as fundamental are familiar, but merit brief restatement in the present context. Modern democratic government means government of the people, by the people, for the people. But there can be no government by the people if they are ignorant of the issues to be resolved the arguments for and against different solutions and the facts underlying those arguments. The business of government is not an activity about which only those professionally engaged are entitled to receive information and express opinions. It is or should be a participatory process. So what Lord Bingham is, is essentially saying here is that free expression is bound up with the right to receive information and to express opinions. And that reflects what's uh, in the European Convention on Human Rights in Article uh, uh, 10. What I'm going to now uh, do is uh, draw your attention to a number of cases which you can read in, in your own time. And perhaps I'm going to close uh, with the, uh, the uh, what Tony Blair and his fellow ministers said when they enacted the uh, or, or proposed and subsequently enacted the Freedom of Information Act 2000. Uh, they uh, enacted this uh, uh, Freedom of Information Act 2000 in order to bust, that was their phrase, what they called the traditional culture of secrecy, which uh, the then Labour government in the late 1990s considered blighted the United Kingdom. So they uh, saw 
what was then the proposed Freedom of Information Act as, as a, a, a sword to pierce through the traditional culture of secrecy. And that's one of the things I think is worth applying to the Republic of Cyprus. This new law that's come into force should be treated as a sword that pierces through the traditional culture of secrecy. And I would suggest silence that has uh, for far too long blighted the Republic of Cyprus. Look at the title. I'm reading here from the then uh, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster's forward to the white paper, which uh, uh, preceded the Freedom of Information Act 2000. Openness is fundamental to the political health of a modern state. So the then Labour government, I'm no fan, I was no fan of the then Labour government, but I did agree with them on this. They, they took the view that openness is fundamental to the political health of a modern state. So again, if we apply this to the Republic of Cyprus, I would suggest that this new law is essential to help improve the political health of the Republic of Cyprus. And I think that's an invitation for me to wind down, which I will. But can I have 30 more seconds? You can have 20. Yeah, I'll just have, uh, I'll just wrap up with this uh, thought here. Um, this is from the Supreme Court case of Sugar, Deceased and British uh, Broadcasting Corporation from 2012. Lord Mance, one of the judges, uh, in the Supreme Court said the following, and this is perhaps a good place to finish. The Freedom of Information Act 2000, this is the UK Act of Parliament, reflects the value to be attached to transparency and openness in the workings of public authorities in modern society, and its provisions should be construed in as liberal a manner as possible. That's a reference to an earlier House of Lords case. But as two of the law lords said in the same case, that proposition must not be applied too widely and special considerations may lead to restrictions. The point, and this is where I'm going to end, the point is that transparency and openness are among the keys to a modern and indeed democratic society. And the new freedom of information law in the Republic of Cyprus should be viewed in that context. Thank you for your time. Can I ask the audience whether they have any questions for their two speakers? Okay, while we are waiting for the audience to think of their questions, <laughs> I have already thought of mine. So um, I have two questions for Andreas, and then I have another question for both Andreas and Glearchos. So the two questions for Andreas are, are more technical in nature and then the last one is directly related to my own research so I'm totally abusing your knowledge here and um, the the first two questions are if I do get if I do send an email to the government and I ask for information and they totally ignore me what remedies do I have do I do I just go back to the information commissioner is that is that what happens so that was question number one. And, and the question, the second question has to do with the exceptions uh, within the law. And you mentioned that there are three exceptions that are outside international standards. Um, and I wanted to hear a bit more about that. And um, why do you think they've been included? What was the rationale there? What are your thoughts about them, etc.? Okay, yep. So um, the in terms of if you don't hear from, if you don't have any response, if you receive administrative silence to your requests, um, I think uh, the first thing would be to try to uh, write to the institution again, just to see if you can get a response from them. Um, that isn't technically, I guess, what you are uh, required to do, but I think it's probably a uh, good practice to do so. Um, although obviously they should have answered me in the first place. And then I would go to, if again you don't receive a reply, I would go to the information commissioner and uh, send your appeal basically, which would be a very basic, I sent this request on this date, I followed up again on this date, and I still have yet to receive a response. Can you please um, make 
pass a judgment on that basically and uh, and require them to give me a response so i think that would probably be the best way of going about it simply because it shows due diligence on your side to have done as much as possible um but you could go straight to the information commissioner if you wished um and can i interrupt can he impose any penalties on on um, or I, department itself I would need to double check. I think in some jurisdictions you can, they do impose penalties and those could be financial penalties on institutions um, for not responding to requests. Uh, I, I would need to double check in the separate situation because, and again, it will depend on um, the severity of the issue and how often it might be occurring, etc. I don't know if in the early days that would be uh, the best approach versus kind of enhanced training and enhanced um, support but it's something that could potentially be explored and if it's not already in the law then it could be something that might be worth amending in the future if it's seen as uh, appropriate um the other that does have its its limitations and then the other question uh which was sorry um about exceptions exceptions so the in so when i talk about international standards um there are various bodies and uh kind of templates um access to information laws that uh, are in place. So there's the, like I mentioned, the Convention on Access to Official Documents, which is the kind of European um, uh, standard, let's say. Um, not, not necessarily that all countries follow that uh, uh, model. There's also an African uh, version uh, and a version from the uh, Americas as well. And, um, but then you also have other institutions like the EU who have their own information, access to information law, which then, you know, is sort of like it's another standard in some ways, although it's slightly different, obviously. Um, with regard to the exceptions in the Cypriot law, which aren't kind of covered by those international, uh, kind of generally agreed international standards, parliamentary privilege was one that's also included in the UK um law which is something that uh is just kind of an, an anomaly from the way that the jurisdiction is in terms of the um parliamentary sovereignty and things like that um and carried over into cyprus uh i can't information providing confidence i think that one um and the security bodies are I, I would need to double check if they're in the british law but again those are i imagine um reasons i mean the good thing is that they're they both have a public interest test on them so regardless of whether they're outside those international standards if there is an overriding public interest in information in the information being requested then it should be um uh disclosed so there is at least that um part to it even though they might be outside of what is considered the kind of norm uh, for exceptions or accepted sort of exceptions um, by most other countries. That isn't to say that other countries don't have their own exemptions that are outside of international standards. That's something which campaigners uh, across Europe and, uh, and many other countries are also trying to sort of reduce and narrow down. But in Cyprus, given the relatively new nature of the law, it's I think more a challenge to understand exactly how broad or not, the exceptions uh, will be interpreted regardless of whether they're part of uh, international standards or not. So um, I think, again, it's a case of we need to start using the law and seeing how it's applied and where these exceptions are being used and challenging that over time uh, to try and make sure that they're as narrow as possible and that um, the broadest uh, possible access to information is provided. Thank you so much. Can I, can I just add, add, add a footnote to what Andreas has said? Um, in the United Kingdom, in practice, if one is uh, seeking an answer to a question or a response to an email or a letter, uh, one has as a fallback mechanism the formal procedures that are built into the Freedom of Information Law, but quite often a, a straightforward way of extracting a successful response to an initial non-response is to uh, threaten to activate a formal complaints procedure or to threaten to report the government department or the private body as the case may be to, to a relevant regulator so um one of the things that i i would i would do is in in and this would be to, to operate in parallel with the formal procedure to threaten to activate whatever internal formal complaints mechanisms exist the problem is it's very difficult to to find out whether a government department has any formal 
mechanism of making a formal complaint. And the second problem is even if that formal uh, complaints mechanism exists and, and details are published, there's no guarantee that it's going to work. So uh, this is the problem you have when you're trying to uh, transfer the experience of the United Kingdom to the Republic of Cyprus. In principle, it sounds good, but when you when you apply it in practice, it, it doesn't often work because we don't simply have a complaints culture or a formal complaints culture in the Republic of Cyprus in the way that we do in the United Kingdom. That shouldn't mean that doesn't mean that we should accept that state of affairs, which is unacceptable. But I would suggest lawyers should be at the forefront of promoting uh, good uh, practices such as um, requesting copies of formal complaints policies and formal complaints forms so that they can be filled in and submitted if necessary. I'd also just uh, want to add there as well that, um, I, you know, if failing all of those kinds of processes, there is always the, uh, the kind of um, public pressure and media pressure that can also kind of force uh, the hand sometimes, but that's obviously uh, another blunt instrument that you might be able to use, but hopefully you don't have to go that far. <laughs> Thank you so much. So my last question, uh, unless anyone in the audience has any burning questions? No. OK, so my last question has to do with the culture of lack of transparency in Cyprus rather than the legal mechanisms. And I was wondering whether I could have your thoughts on what you think explains this, uh, this uh, culture of lack of transparency in Cyprus in particular. And I have a um, rather wild hypothesis that I was uh, wondering whether you could comment on. And um, th this country has been in a state of uh, national security crisis in one way, shape or form from essentially the moment it was created from 1970, uh, from 1963 onwards, at the very least from 1974 onwards. And I was wondering whether this idea that we are in a national security crisis since the moment Cyprus was born has contributed to a, a lack of transparency because in the national security crisis, we don't share that much information. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was my wild hypothesis. I was wondering why, whether you think it is totally out there or whether it has any merit. And I, can I uh, start with Andreas and then go to Claire? Yeah, um, I mean, my uh, caveat here to all my answer to my answer is that I'm uh, a British Cypriot. I'm based in the UK, so I'm not, you know, totally familiar with the Cypriot context in the same uh, respect. But I think probably your uh, assumptions are have 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 merit. <laughs> um, uh, and I would say that often, in many cases, those security uh, questions are used as an excuse for a multitude of sins in Cyprus and is one reason why many things in Cyprus don't necessarily advance um, as smoothly as maybe or progress as smoothly as they could do uh, because of um, security uh, issues whether they are legitimate excuses or not so I think you're probably hitting uh, something there but um, there might be other reasons as well um, yeah. Thank you so much. Claire? Yes, very good question. Uh, I've been thinking about this for, for some time. I, I, I always refer to the, the seas that afflict the Republic of Cyprus and help to account for what's gone wrong. So I'll, 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 I'll single out four of them. One is colonialism, centuries of colonialism. Um, the colonial the, the Turkish and then the British colonial authorities were not as transparent as one would have wished them to be. And that's partly because those colonial epochs uh, unfolded in an age when transparency was not um, given the high priority that it, it has been in the post-1945 epoch and more, more recently in the post-1960s um, epoch. And, and as a result of colonialism and other factors, uh, we instead of we have really this top-down form of government. This is the explanation. It's not an excuse in 2021 for this to continue, but this is what we have: the, the, those in power at the top, and we, the citizens, down here. And that is, they look at us from above, and we look at them from down here. 
And whereas what you want in a, in, in, a, in, in a democracy, everyone is equal under the law, so there should be a sort of a more horizontal relationship and a social contract to use um, is it Rousseau's phrase and an interaction between the two where there is trust and confidence operating at a mutual level. So colonialism is one of the, the historical causes of, of the lack of transparency. It's not an excuse for it to continue in the 21st century, but it's a, certainly a background uh, factor. The second C is what I call uh, clientelism, which is the, uh, the practice that has built up over centuries, but it's particularly pronounced in the post-1960 period through the political parties. So you have, and they're normally men, powerful men, often associated with a political party. Uh, they have their own networks of power and patronage and influence. And if you want anything done, you try to fall under the, I've not done this, but I know others have done this, you fall under the wing of one of these powerful men who may or may not be in a political party and those powerful men can help um, you find work they can help you secure a permit from a government ministry they can se secure an answer to a question that you've put to a minister that's gone unanswered uh, and he help you come into contact with uh, businesses and business opportunities that can help your business flourish uh, and that is a phenomenon that we find uh, in, uh, in an unhealthy uh, extent in the Republic of Cyprus. So, so clientelism is a second uh, cause of the lack of transparency because clientelism does not want things put down in writing. A lot of these relationships operate uh, behind closed doors with conversations and with telephone calls rather than through formal mechanisms of, of, of transparency. So clientelism is a, is a second cause. Um, it's no excuse, but it's a, it's it's a, it's an explanation. The th the third C is of course conflict, and wherever you have conflict, you try to um, duck and dive and survive rather than uh, build up a democratic culture. So in in the United Kingdom, we've never been invaded, uh, at least not since 1066. And if we exclude the Channel Islands, which are not part of the United Kingdom. We've never been invaded since 1066, never been subject to an occupation. We haven't been subject to a civil war since the 17th century. We've never been subject to the, the sort of uh, internal and international pressures that have blighted the Republic of Cyprus. So what happens when you have conflict uh, is the instinct to survive. What, what can I do as an individual to survive? And therefore the idea of promoting democracy in, in a democratic culture which we take for granted in the United Kingdom, we will try and improve democracy and a democratic culture. It's not given the high priority that, that it deserves to be. So the third C is, is, is conflict. And the fourth C, I have to mention it, is corruption. Corruption has become endemic in the Republic of Cyprus, both in terms of its criminal and its non-criminal manifestations. I prefer the word impropriety, which is a one that uh, was used by John Profumo on the floor of the House of Commons, and it was the word that brought about his downfall. Impropriety, uh, including procedural impropriety, have become endemic in the Republic of Cyprus. They've become normalised. People take it for granted that if in order to get something done, you need to use a, a, what's called a mess on. Somebody in the right place, in the, at the right time, with the right connections, who can pull the strings to get things done that should be done anyway. Or... The meson can be used to do things improperly uh, for cer in circumstances that should not happen in the first place. But that culture of impropriety uh, has really contaminated political life in the Republic. And yet again, that system of uh, meson, the system of pulling strings, the system of of, of scratching uh, one person's back in government for that person to then scratch your back. That again is all conducted in, in secrecy behind closed doors. And one doesn't have to um, look very far to find examples of that that have recently come to light thanks to investigative journalism. I won't mention any specific cases here, but that culture of meeting behind closed doors is again endemic. It's the way things are done in the Republic of Cyprus and that needs that needs to change. 
So if, if I can leave uh, uh, the audience with this thought and I go back to my main argument, the new freedom of information law is an exceptionally helpful new tool in the toolbox of both the lawyer and the ordinary citizen. That new tool must be used. It must not be abused, of course, but it must be used uh, and it must be followed through. Uh, so if there is a non-response, there may, needs to be a follow through. But that tool on its own is not enough. We need on the one hand a change of culture and we need on the other hand all of the other tools in the toolbox of democracy to be used by the citizen and by the lawyer of the citizen. And if all of us individually and collectively can conduct ourselves accordingly, we can hopefully build a more democratic and modern Republic of Cyprus for the benefit of everybody and for the benefit of the rule of law. Thank you so much, Claire. Yeah, do you have any final comments? No, I think that was a lovely way to end the uh, <laughs> end it. So um, I shan't add any more, but thank you. Thank you. Does anyone in the audience have any final comments or questions? Well, since no one has anything to add, this concludes the, um, the, the webinar. Thank you everyone for attending. Can I please turn the audience's attention to the chat? Andrea has um, asked for feedback. If you could either press on the link or complete the, um, the document that has been attached, that would be really appreciated. Good night from me. Have a lovely evening. Bye.